This episode is brought to you by Circle, the issuer of USDC, one of the most trusted stable coins in the digital asset industry. You'll be hearing all about them later in the show. Mike, welcome back to the show. Hello, Michael. Thanks for having me back. I'm a big fan of yours and your guests and your podcast. I really appreciate it. You know, one time uh, when we're doing the show together, I got to get you to wear the cowboy hat uh, for visitor for uh, viewers who are tuning in uh, on video. You really do pull it off. It's a stunning, uh, you know, it's a piece of resistance, I would say. Well, it, I, I, a lot of people tease me about it. I don't go leave outside without it, particularly in Miami. And having commuted in the New York City for 30 years, once it gets below 58 degrees, I got to have a cover up there. <laughs> but before we start, I want to mention one thing I appreciate mm. about that is there was a one podcast you were doing and you mentioned you were 20 years old. And I was like, wow, you got the wisdom of someone who's 30. And one of the particular reasons I think why is because you're a very avid reader. It's something I've noticed with people I've worked through all these years, in particular with my son, is people who read a lot um, typically have a, de a definite advantage from those who don't. I really appreciate that. Thanks very much. I used to, you know, I, when I was a kid, I used to read uh, like eight, nine hours a day. Actually, I, my parents were literally like, you got to get out of the house, buddy. <laughs> like, we're we're, we're, <laughs> we're working on worried about you. Yeah, you got to get out of the house. But I appreciate that maybe even 5% of that knowledge uh, has stuck around with me. So thanks very much. That's very complimentary. But um, it's a fact, but it's so important with your questions. And sure, we'll get into that, some of that stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'd actually love, you know, we're recording this on Monday, the 26th. Um, so this is actually after something that I would love for speaking of history for you to maybe help us put in historical context. So we saw the, uh, the British pound sell off uh, pretty violently over this last weekend. That's extending losses from Friday. This is seemingly in response to a, a plan that's coming out of the UK um, from the new uh, trust administration there, which is essentially uh, tax cuts. Um, so it's some $45 billion worth of tax cuts. And it saw the the pound sell off relative to the dollar to, I think, a record low, right? Which is just uh, just under a dollar and four cents. Um, can you help put this in historical context for me? Because when I think of the pound, I mean, the pound, you know, not so long ago was actually a global reserve currency itself. It's still, you know, uh, the currency of a, a G7 nation. Walk us through, how, how big of a deal is this? Well, it's the only thing that's constant in life other than dex, death and taxes is change. Mm. And obviously, British Empire is no longer an empire. But um, you intrigued me to pull up the chart of the pound. And I've been involved with the pound for many years. But mm. our chart in terms goes back to 1971. It has that clear trend of anything versus the dollar in history. The dollar goes up and it goes down. I mean, yep. all, all, all fiat currencies have that trend. Now, maybe one Swissy goes up, but any kind of basket goes down. And to me, this is um, actually the all-time low I see in a term was 1.05, but it looks like we got pretty close there. And that's typically the closing basis, so how mm -hmm. we market. And yep. 1.07, as we speak, of course, this is a little bit delayed from when we're going to air. But the trend is clearly from the upper left to the lower right, as Dennis Gartman used to say, it's just going down. And then let's look at the key reason why. I'm, I've been a, a perpetual dollar bull if people have called me because the one thing you will look at is the number one thing that really fa is a factor for shows maybe a leading indicator factor for the dollars. If you look at U.S. equities divided by the world ex-U.S. equities, that trend is linear relationship up with the dollar. And not mm. only that, it's just reflective of where do you want to put your money? I mean, just see so you're an alien, you come down from um, another world, where are you going to put your money right now? You see what's going on in Europe. And then you see this bastion of capitalism. It's not perfect, but see the, see the shining sea security all around. I mean, the joke my 25-year-old likes to kid around is like, we can just go invade Canada and they'll probably say, cool. Maybe Mexico. I mean, we have a direct route to Florida now. <laughs> it's just funny. I mean, but it's a joke, but it's true. Strongest political system, very much flawed. But what do we do versus the rest of the world, particularly in China and Europe and, and China and um, in Russia is we beat ourselves up and we come to conclusions. Highest interest rates, it's unstoppable when you measure, and then people talk about debt to GDP. I mean, have you looked at Japan lately? <laughs> I mean, but mm. it's just, it's just, there's no, it's what Churchill says about democracies when you look at the dollar. It's just the worst of all, except for all the other ones. And the key thing I like to point out is we will at some point get a dollar correction, but it typically the dollar never goes down 
unless it goes up a lot first. It just retraces. That's mm -hmm. the same thing with crude oil. Crude oil never goes up unless it goes down a lot first and retraces. That's just what I call the enduring bull market for the dollar and during bear market for crude oil. And we'll dig into that later. But to me, that's where I look at right now is it's unstoppable right now until you see the lose-lose situation of U.S. stock market going down, which is part of my lose-lose for the U.S. stock market, because everything's starting to break, just not the big stuff. It's broken in cryptos. We've seen that. Now, that's good because cryptos are top leading indicator. But when people get bearish to dollar, I'll leave you with this. I always like to point out the bottom line, the stuff that you and I see the most is what's the most widely traded cryptos on the planet? They're crypto dollars, dollar mm -hmm. tokens. And that happened organically. And this is the key thing that we pointed out two years ago. The US, unless we're stupid, is not going to mess this up. This mm -hmm. bastion of free market capitalism, cryptos, blockchain, all that silly stuff with um, how people want to just call it, but that whole infrastructure, which is only a little bit less than one trillion, went for the dollar as the number one traded um, asset. And that to me is quite profound for where the world wants to go. It doesn't want the yuan, the euro, the yen. Hmm. Now, uh, can we, I want to get a little bit more specific on the situation over in the UK and why we saw this pronounced currency move, right? I think, and again, I just want to, the reason that Mike and I keep uh, time stamping here is because this is a rapidly evolving situation and it might have yeah. changed materially <laughs> by the time this airs on Friday. So I just want to keep saying this is the situation as it stands today. But it seems like what the market is saying is, hey, uh, UK, I understand that you want to come in here, you want to implement uh, price caps, you want to, uh, you know, you want, you want to implement uh, tax cuts as well to kind of get the economy going. We do not believe that you can afford this. Is that the way that you're reading the situation as well? Or am I missing something there? That's pretty much the macro. It's typically, I, 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 my lesson I've learned, um, having lost a lot of money markets, is focus on the force. And the force is quite simple. It's political. Currencies will always be political, always will be, and always have been. That's part of how Bitcoin came about. This is part of almost sitting touched on in the, the Bitcoin white paper. And it's how politics and politicians will always print more money. Governments will always print more money to help solve their current domestic problems. There's a big problem in the UK. They're going to throw more money on it. They're going to create more inflation for them. But again, it's an island. Yeah. <laughs> the U.S. is basically a continent, um, hmm. and it's a small island. And it's also making people realize some of the key mistakes they made did uh, made in Europe, like res restricting fracking and horizontal drilling, and the U and focusing too much on you know, cutting out nuclear. Um, and you know, this is just poor decisions accelerating, and it's accelerating. The cool thing I love about free trading of currencies, it's you know, the, the, the currency vigilantes. You're pound that currency mm. because it's showing that um, the global market does not agree with your policies, at least in the short term. Now, I don't see what ends this trend. I'm sure it's going to bounce in the short term, but right now, um, it doesn't look too good. And it's just how you're measuring the pound versus the dollar. And versus, I mean, dollar is another fiat currency. Hmm. Now, you mentioned the currency vigilantes. That's something that we haven't seen for a little while, right? This was kind of in the, there's a reference maybe back to the George Soros, Dan Druckenmiller days of uh, yeah. breaking the Bank of England, right? Um, but back then, right, it was very typical when there was stress on a currency for the central bank of that country to step in and start defending the currency. One of the interesting things about the UK that I didn't understand until this particular, uh, the, the sell off in, in the pound was just how little foreign exchange reserve they have, right? So there's a chart yeah. uh, where that's getting shared around on Twitter and we can, I think I'm going to struggle to pull it up on my screen here, but maybe we can add it in later. But it's basically showing, you know, the UK's foreign exchange reserves compared to some of the other multinationals, right? And for, for the UK, there's something like just over $100 billion worth of foreign exchange compared to China's $3 trillion, right? And it's not broken out what uh, what the dollar makes up of that that amount. But it's still, it seems like a pretty small amount to be able to defend the peg, especially at a time when foreign exchange markets are so much more liquid than they were back in the 1990s. So one dollar of peg defending ability is just not going to go as far as it did back then. So how how much do you think that uh, the UK has in terms of their firepower at their disposal to to defend their currency? Well, the, if you have to defend your currency, you usually lose. It's already too late, typically. Um, and I just pulled up the chart as we were looking at and UK and the IMF foreign reserve exchange holdings. The key thing is as far as relative, I don't know so much, but I see a trend going from the lower left to the upper right. It's actually been collapsing this year, but not. it's still mm. much higher than it was just a few years ago. But to me, the key thing to remember here is um, 
now you mentioned, th I think the more significant thing early on, because of all the monetary or the fiscal stimulus, the, the Bank of England's going to have to offset that. <laughs> Right. It's just how it works, which is lose-lose. Mm. But that is part of the reason for the separation and the independence of the central, uh, the Federal Reserve. A lot of people push back on this, but that's one thing I've been impressed with lately with Chairman Powell. I mean, he, he told um, President Trump no. When tre President Trump said to pump the system with liquidity, he said, I will not resign. And now him and Biden are actually coordinating for this major attack on inflation, which means guaranteed recession. I'm impressed by that, which probably means Biden's not going to be reelected. They're going to have a very poor showing in the midterms, but they still agreed on it. And maybe it's sometimes you get these older people are thinking, well, maybe I'm thinking more about my legacy and how history is going to judge me and make the right decisions now rather than making the political decisions to get reelected. Hmm. That, I mean, how much, you know, it's, it seems like a common refrain that you've heard a lot. First of all, there's just outright pessimism across the entire investing community uh, writ large. But the general sentiment seems to be around what Powell's doing is that he's going to hike rates until, and I quote, something breaks, right? So I'm kind of looking at the pound selling off the way that it has and wondering to myself, you know, does this constitute, maybe this isn't yeah. the straw that breaks the camel's back, so to speak, but Powell's certainly got to be watching this and not loving this as a development, right? Well, you, you nailed it. Something is breaking. FX is a start. There will be, we're just waiting for um, something to break. It will happen. Maybe a significant emerging market um, um, defaulting on their debt. But this is how you, how, usually how it happens. When you see the yen up 20% in one year, the euro 15% down in one in year, the dollar index up 15% in one year, that's breaking the world economy. That's your global depression. And I didn't say recession. We're still til we're tilting towards. It's just a matter of time until something breaks, until something gives up and they have to provide mm -hmm. liquidity. But uh, this is, it's happening in real time. The point is the difference compared to last time we spoke in early in the years, no one agreed with it. Now the world's starting right. to agree. Okay. Sell every rally I can in the stock market. Cause we all know we're heading to recession globally. We all know what's happening in China. They're plunging. They have a property crisis. that's much worse than ours was in 2008. People mm -hmm. are blaming it on COVID. I mean, that's the mask. Um, and uh, to me, this is part of getting into, this is stuff breaking. And um, but the key thing I want to point out is having worked at primary dealers all my career is the Fed virtually never discusses the dollar at their meetings. That's what I've got from my Fed watchers. That's not a key. It's not part of their mandate. Dollars is something to watch. But if it makes something break, they'll watch it. If the global economy is collapsing and it's going to make a demand for every, you know, make kick in deflationary trends, which I fully expect. Um, then they'll, they'll um, notice. But right now they're job owning and they're doing a good job of it. The key thing I miss was when um, Chairman Powell earlier in the year said, oh, we're going meeting by meeting. This was like May or June and we had that mm. big short covering rally. That was good because we flushed out those shorts and we got the, the last of the dip buyers to come in. But it's bad because he shouldn't have said that. And then he's been spending the time walking it back. That's not mm. a big deal, but it just triggered the market's need to go up. And that's the key thing to mention is the whole tide is going out now. Mm. Even bonds collapsing. The only part of this sector that really did well this is commodities. And commodities are the most mean reverting um, assets, and they're going to collapse too. If they're based on historical precedent, that's my view. And they're just starting as we speak. You know, it's Monday. Crude oil's almost unchanged in a year. That's been my call and people, it's, and, and, I'll, and I'll mention this, it's the idiot versus genius factor. And when you're a guy like me, who's completely independent, and that's one thing I love, having been buy side and sell side, being at Bloomberg, I mean, they edit to me to make it so I don't write stupid stuff, but I have my own views and I express them way because my goal is to be right. Mm -hmm. Not to help, not to um, help a specific, my, help my firm sell something. And the idiot factor really hit an extreme HQ1, Q2, when I said, you know, crude oil's up 130, it's going back to 50. It just always is. Now um, I'm being looking less as an idiot, but I had, to ha I had to get to that point. And it's one of those things I really enjoy. It happened to me a lot in crypto sometimes when they call you an idiot. They usually know you're right, you trigger something. And now mm -hmm. we're getting back to the point with crude oil dropping to almost unchanged in the year. By the time this prints, it might be below. It's got a lot more to go, and that's just pointing out what happens in history with the world's most significant mean reverting commodity. But what's happened is energy prices spiked. The Federal Reserve and every central bank in the world followed that with inflation. Oh, we have to hike more, and now it's going to come back at the fastest pace, I think, in history, which means we're going to go into significant deflationary period. Mm. How much um, of that do you attribute? Right? I, I know Mark uh, 
there is a political connection with oil, right? What, it's one of the strongest predictors of a president's approval rating is the price of gasoline, right? So obviously, it's not really a secret that Biden has had a pretty low approval rating. You know, you can just you can chart and and now that gas prices are finally starting to turn around, that approval rating is starting to come back up. How much do you attribute that mean reversion to just supply and demand type factors weighing on the price versus political powers that be, right, or administrations, not just in the US, but but globally as well, kind of saying, hey, we're going to do whatever we can to ease the price of gasoline. All the above, I'm, at some point, maybe we should get me and Mark on together so we can point mm. counterpoint because we have a few good disagreements and I think we're good at disagreeing and having fun doing it. But the key fact is that's what added to my bearishness this year. When you have the world's most significant energy producer on the planet, net exporter, now, compared to the largest importer 10 years ago, people miss what happened there. And there's a, an election come up, and it helps if the incumbent party gets elected. If energy prices go down, energy prices were going to go down. Mark nailed that. And that, to me, was the double whammy. Sure, they're going to release the SPR. And I wrote on that a few times about the uh, SPRs. The only really reason you need the Strategic Petroleum Reserve anymore is to help protect us against um, uh things like hurricanes that are coming towards um, Florida and stuff right down the Gulf, because it is redundant. A good example is I started pumping gas at a gas station in 1979, and we had a chart price, the price of a gallon of gas and a half a gallon because it went over a dollar, <laughs> and they hadn't configured yeah. it. That world back then has changed. The U.S. now is the net largest producer of energy and agriculture, and we have the power to, you know, and that's just by slightly adopting this advancing technology and it's nothing that it's supply going straight up but actually consumption has been declining it peaked in 2005 liquid fuel consumption in this country so to me that's what's happening in this global space the SBR and the political forces help that but in the big picture Biden is toast the Democratic Party is toast partly because they lean too far to the green side and that's what I loved about you know it's nothing perfect but perfect but this bill we had come up recently they did call it the uh, Inflation Reduction Act it did do what I was hoping. Focus on the current situation, bring out as much supply as possible, and then you know, help the renewable energy factor. But just by normal um, rapid leasing, te advancing technology, we're going to replace fossil fuels with with technology. That's a quote I heard 10 years ago. And that's for me, I, I love, I, I have an electric car. I have two electric bikes. I powered my house with solar power. I had most of my heat from wood, but I still had hooked up to the grid and still really appreciated when things got really cold, I can kick in that heating oil and I have a grid all the time. You have to just, it's just that organic trend is completely accelerated. Now Europe's going through pain right now, but when they look back at this five, five years from now, they're going to say, thank you. Now we've transitioned so fast. We use less of fossil fuels. We can create more of it we want. And we are really focusing on all the renewables and storage is going to be a key thing. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of time. I want to ask you about something that came up. So this is going to be coming out Friday. So the Wednesday interview of this week is going to be with Doomberg, everyone's favorite green chicken. We were, uh, you know, very time in a very timely way, actually, we were talking about this on Friday, uh, just before the pounds started selling off. But he was making the connection in between a country's energy independence and the strength of its currency. So drawing that connection in between a country's ability to produce enough energy to power, feed its yes. citizens, power through the winter, and the strength of the currency. How much do you think, A, do you agree with that framework? Do you think that that's being oh, priced okay. into currency markets right now? And B, do you see that also being a factor yeah. for why the pound is just sold off? That's part of the unstoppable power of the dollar. So let's look at North American liquid fuel production. Mm. This is data from the Department of Energy versus consumption will be a surplus next year around 20%. That's just based on the ongoing trends. Unless prices collapse to offset that production increase in versus consumption. That's a matter of fact. That's part of the unstoppable force about the dollar. And I wrote about this in February, actually right before the um, election. Um, and the unstoppable force of agriculture. We are a net, we export 50% of our soybeans, 50% of our wheat, and about 20% of our corn. <laughs> We're the largest on the planet. And that is from, I'm from the Corn Belt. You can tell because sometimes I say dem, dees, and does. I mean, I'm from Chicago, but I had a farm. And that's where a lot of my brethren is. My brother who visited in, in Miami just drove back to his farm. He got back there um, yesterday. And uh, today, actually. And that is just, it's its what's going on out there. People have to see the, you see a blanket of corn. Now, yeah, that's not perfect in the corn belt. And in between, once in a while, you see wind turbines. Mm. And then once in a while, I had a, I was by my parents for an, a family reunion a few months ago. And we drove by my friend's house and there's a, oh, well, there's a nuclear power plant. 
it's just amazing what's happening in this country. Yes, there's regulation, but um, you hear about all the pushback. It's just shocking to me. And then I hear about what's happening, all the restrictions in the rest of the world. And yes, that's part of the strength of the dollar. And then there's this minor factor of 11 aircraft carrier battle groups in the world's most powerful military. And the thing is, it's the benefit of low expectations. I always love that. It's part of being a student in Europe when I was in the 80s. Is, yeah, I like to play that low expectation thing, but don't underestimate U.S. military, what they can do, in, and it's intelligence. The amount of intelligence they're letting you hear and see about what's happening in Ukraine is a trickle of what's happening that's really helped Ukrainians win this war. I virtually guarantee that because almost always it's intelligence that wins wars. I speak to a lot of companies in both crypto and traditional finance, and as it turns out, they share a common problem. They need a one-stop shop for treasury management and fast international payments around the globe. Circle's USDC is one of the most trusted and widely used stablecoins in the industry. At the time of this recording, USDC has 50 billion in circulation, one and a half million users worldwide, and is settling more than $5 trillion. That's trillion with a T worth of value. USDC has quickly become one of the easiest ways to move your money around the globe. On top of all that, Circle is building products for companies and institutions that want to adopt this technology. That means payment transactions, fraud management tools, digital asset custody, and a whole other suite of services. Here's one of my other favorite parts about Circle. They post monthly audits of their reserves, which means that I don't have to trust. I can verify that my money is safe, transparent, in a compliant manner. Helps me sleep easy at night, you know? As a seamless trusted digital dollar, USDC is a zero to one opportunity for the entire global financial system. And you know what? Don't trust me, you can verify. Check out their recently published Transparency Hub on the website. It's a great update to Circle's content in USDC, outlines everything from USDC weekly reserve reports, monthly attestations, and blog posts written by their exec team. Just go to circle.com backslash transparency to access it. Now, back to the show. Hmm. I, I want to... Uh, Bring us back to the dollar. So looking at the DXY, yeah. um, and that is above 114 today, which is not historic all-time highs, but it's certainly within the top uh, decile, right? I think the the all-time high was 126. It got it got all the way back up to back in like the late 80s, early 90s. Um, still, I, I think in, when you're paying attention to the DXY, right, it's the it's the absolute level, but it's also the rate of change. And if you look at that index over the course of the last six months, the last three months, it has been a a one-way streak up and it's been moving uh, you know, relatively quickly. So I guess my question to you is, there's this phrase that people like to throw around, the dollar wrecking ball. A higher dollar means stress on the rest of the world, especially some of our developed economy allies, right? So the Japans of the world, the UKs, the Europe's. How much stress do you see this causing on the international stage? Oh, significant. One thing I like to, as we speak, I'm going to just pull up this on the terminal DXY. I always like to, I mean, um, I, the answer is yes a lot. I typically watch, like to watch the Fed, Federal Reserve's calculated tra trade, <laughs> trade weighted, weighted dollar index because mm. it, it's, it's about 20% to China's yuan because it's what really matters in terms right. of global trade. And the thing I like to mention about the DXY, you just inspired me to do this. You always, it's relative movements that matter the most. Um, and right now, the DXY relative to its 100-week moving average is 18% above that. It's only happened once in history at the peak in 2015, right before the, the collapse. So mm. it's pretty well extended. 100 weeks is pretty standard. It's you know, almost two years. It's two years. Um, but that's the relative strength of it. The thing is... DXY is measured virtually against the Europe. We all know Europe's basically a basket case. I mean, they're not, they don't have, um, I shouldn't say a basket case, but there's so many independent countries. I mean, I live there. We all know why most of us Americans have emigrated from there because of the wars and forever. But comparing to another, ba you know, bigger baskets, like we have a, a Bloomberg index and the trade weighted broad dollar, I see it's not nearly as much as it, it rallied as much in, into the peak in 1985. I remember that well. I was in France as a student. Um, but this is what's breaking. And this is part of what the Fed ignores. And the number one way to make this stop happen is the U.S. stock market going down relative to the rest of the world. Yes, there's other things in the big picture, but that's been one of the key drivers over time is the U.S. stock market outperforming the rest of the world. Now, yes, it might be a little bit lagging when people start flowing, taking their money out of U.S. assets, but where are they going to go? <laughs> I mean, mm. I honestly, okay, in the short term, even the bond market, it's the, it's the lesson I learned trading treasuries years ago. Is there's no bond market in the world that's even close to the U.S. depth, um, um, security, volatility, 
getting 4% on a two-year note right now? Thank you very much. I mean, what yeah, person right. in the world is not going to do that? So people only sell treasuries because they say, oh, they have to. And, I, I'm, and that's, so I, I look at it as um, that's, this is part of breaking right now in this rest of the world. This is part of, to me, is going to be the great recession it's kicking in this year. I'm calling 2022 the great, great reversion. And I view this as very similar to 1929. Well, that's a uh, that's a little bit of a scary thought in general. I the, here, so here's the thing: like the, the 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 flip side, the inverse of everything that we're saying is, on the one hand, a very strong dollar, especially a rapidly rising dollar, is very painful for the rest of the world. On the other hand, maybe you can just help me reason this out: it, a rising dollar, rising yields in the U.S. also means that there's capital inflows moving into the United States. So it's kind of hard to see a crash from that perspective as well. Can you help me just rationalize those two ideas? Because it's, you know, even just trying to think through them on first principles, sometimes I get a little bit confused. Yes, that's a good point. And it's a good point to say it's less likely to see a crash in U.S. equities. Mm -hmm. But typically, dollar flows will flow to uh, fixed income T-bills mm -hmm. and two-year notes. Not really long bonds, but when you can get literally 4.3%, I pointed this out a few months ago, is the highest rates in the world, the most, the, in, the deepest bond market, and most likely that the inflation is going to collapse is in the U.S. Mm. Um, and the Fed's there for you. I mean, you're not going to go to the British pound right now. <laughs> you look what happened there. So yeah. maybe you will because of relative value, but that's the key thing. But why are this equity markets um, declining? Why is the dollar? Part of the reason dollar is um, reacting is because we have just gone through the biggest pump in liquidity money supply ever got like 26% ever. I mean, yep. I go back to 1960 and now we're in the middle of the biggest dump. We're taking li 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 liquidity at the greatest pace ever. Now I'm only 60, which means risk assets have to go down. So it's that, you know, that sugar high that every tiny single time the market went down 20%, the Fed would ease is going away. So people get that there's sellers up above in the equity markets. The, the mature long-term long -term rational money managers understood this punch bowl is being taken away and the party lasted for 40 years. So it's going to last a while and it's very likely to head towards recession. But if you look at it this way, I look at it, if I'm an international investor, maybe some combination of U.S. equities, but I think long bonds are going to be some of the best performers. I've been wrong. But mm. typically once this triggers, once we get that little flip, it's going to happen so fast. I expect rates to drop double the velocity, or maybe quicker the velocity than they went up, and then we have this enduring deflationary recession kicking in. But this is the difference now. The world has changed. The Fed will not be there to save you once we save you once we, you know, get death threats, and they will get death threats. Paul Volcker got them. So I'd love to just uh, maybe even zoom out from what we're talking about here and get your base case for what the next year sort of looks like, right? So we talked about the price of oil falling. Uh, we talked about the Fed continuing to crank interest rates higher, even at the same time that we see CPI falling, uh, or at least trending in the right direction. What's your base case for what just happens? Maybe what are the most couple a couple most important things that you're thinking about? The beginning of an enduring deflationary recession in response to the excessive excesses of excess that peaked in 2021. Cryptos are a good part of that. They went up the most, they've gone down the most, and they're probably going to stabilize. So I think some of the best performing assets will be um, long bonds, gold, and Bitcoin. I think the stock market's going to have a pretty significant correction akin to 1930s. Um, and it's a simple peak. How about in 2000, it took 13 years to take, take out that high? Well, we should have similar, had similar extremes. What we've never had is the... Foundation, I mean, foundation for mercy, all dumps in history is going up too high on the mm. back of easy money. We've just never had money this easy ever. Now, I'm not blaming any for any, anybody for that. Remember, it was only about a year ago we got vaccines, and there was a lot of fear out there. So, yeah, the Fed had to make the risk of pumping up all this secure, liquidity, but we didn't get that. We had a, a blip of a recession. Now we're going to get a significant recession globally. And I fully expect there's going to be a lot of good to come out of this. In the meantime, we've got to have a lot more pain to reduce inflation. We'll get that. I think inflation is going to drop at extremely high velocity. People don't realize that yet. Like the base effect in crude oil, going from 50 to 130 is pretty significant. Going back down to 50 is what it's going to do. So I fully expect things like crude oil to do what they always have been. It's one of the most significant mean reverting commodities on the planet. 
crude oil mm. goes up a lot, goes down a lot, but it never, I mean, the price right now, 77 bucks, which might be different when this airs, is the same price as 2007. Imagine if we said that about the stock market, 15 years unchanged, that's called deflationary forces. So I think they're, I think what Jeff Booth pointed out in his book, The Price of the Mar- Tomorrow, of all kicking in, hopefully you won't have a nuclear risk out of uh, Russia, Ukraine. If that happens, it, it tilts the world to the more extreme recession. It, it boosts prices like grains and key bills. And who knows how bad that can get. But to me, that's my base case. And I don't see anything to stop it at this point. Now, the key thing is when I mentioned this six, well, what, what, September, when I mentioned this nine months ago, people use the idiot factor on me. Now it's less the idiot factor. And it's just pointing out facts of history. So I think gold's going to come out of this head. Typical commodities do what they always do. They mean revert and they get cheap. So I think what's going to have to happen is risk assets are going to have to get real cheap. Housing. Housing should collapse. I mean, look what um, interest rates have done. And it's just a matter of time that all the lagging indicators follow that. I mean, inflation is very much lagging. I think everything is basically going to follow copper. It's down 24% in the year for a reason. Crude oil probably end up down 24%. And this is just what happened in 2008. But remember, that was just US-centric. This is global. China is collapsing. I and mean, when we pointed this out years ago, why do they steal intellectual property? We know how to answer that question. But the housing market there is horrible. And they have no, no good fixes. It's, their, their stimulation is beyond. Remember, look, and their currency is starting to plunge too. Hmm. Europe is collapsing. What gets Europe out of this? Maybe some kind of enduring peace, but Putin has to leave. Gone, completely gone. But for that, to, you know, people can't trust him. And so I view this as 1929, 30s kicking in, and the Fed the most reluctant in history to provide liquidity, partly because they learned the lesson of too much liquidity. Let's. I, I would love to get your thoughts on just gold in general. So gold, we did an interview with um, the Dans, uh, Tapiero and Moorhead back in February of this year. Yeah. And you know, Dan had this. This uh, Moorhead had this kind of funny refrain. I'm going to paraphrase and not get it perfectly right. But if you told someone, you know, in 1980 that. Uh, you know, interest rates were going to be, you know, at 0%, right? Uh, all like inflation was going to be at, uh, you know, 8.6%, like over eight handle inflation, but what would you guess gold is doing? And, you know, if it was flat to no one in a million years would have guessed flat to down. Why do you think gold's been having such a tough time? Um, first primary factor is um, the dollar. Gold has made new highs in terms of the euro and the yen. And virtually any other melting currency on the planet is doing what it's supposed to do. Mm. It's not doing well in terms of dollars in the U.S. because of what the Fed's doing. I mean, they've raised how many? 300 basis points this year. That's a significant amount. Why would you want gold when you can get T-bills and get right now 4% in a two-year note? Um, so to me, that's the key risk. And it's just a matter of time that gold does what it always has done. It's one of the best conform- performing commodities in history on a total return basis. Because you look at other commodities, if you have to hold that commodity and pay that storage, and then supply keeps coming more, coming on, gold's one of the best ones. I think it's going to do that if this is part of that sledgehammer from the Fed building a foundation for gold. I didn't think it'd get much below $1,700 an ounce. But again, I didn't think the dollar would collapse or rally 20% versus the euro and the yen this year. So to me, that's the key thing. And it's a matter of time that gold just keeps doing what it's been doing. But bottom line is you can't hold gold anymore without Bitcoin in that bucket. That's the way I look at it. It has to be in there unless you expect the world to go backwards. And not even backwards, but to go backwards in terms of digitalization. Because we could go backwards with wars and things like what's happening in, in Europe, but Bitcoin has its value. You can transmit, transport it instantly, no problem, on your phone or your thumb drive. But to me, that's the main reason. But again, this is a dollar-centric measure of gold. It's um, going down in dollar terms. But there's one thing, as that's, but gold's not that complicated. I wanted to spin one thing a little bit from earlier about my base case. And I just want to end on this, Michael. I'm very, very optimistic how we're going to come out of this whole thing. Gold's part Mm. of it. And that is we're going to go to a new world where bad news is bad news for stocks. Amen. It's no longer the Fed. Good news is good news for stocks. That's going to be wonderful. People like me won't have to say every time I look at crude oil, I'm going to have to say, well, how's the stock market doing? Because the Fed's doing it. So that's going to make crude oil move. Go back to a real world. And the Fed knows that. Finally, they're going to break that umbilical cord. And we're going to go back and who's, what's the country with most likely to really succeed in this global environment the next five, 10 years? It's the U.S. I had one more question for you as well, based on your observation on housing. Housing has to crash, right? I think one of the, uh, I mean, everyone's probably seen the 30-year fixed rate, you know, the, the rate that you'll get for a mortgage. It, you yeah. know, it's jumping from under 2% to whatever it is, 6.5% or so now. So obviously what that means is 
not only is just the amount that you're paying for a mortgage, it's there's there's a really interesting stat that you, you can probably see it on your Bloomberg terminal, but it's the percentage of people's disposable income that's going towards oh, yeah. their mortgage, and that's hopping up, um, you yeah. know, quite a bit. Paulson, uh, John Paulson, right, who made famously made a ton of money basically shorting subprime, said that he had an article. I don't know. It went live in Bloomberg this weekend. I was reading it, uh, and he basically said this time is going to be a little bit different because you don't have that. Uh, variable rate mortgage thing that kicked in with subprime. And most of the mortgages in the US is fixed rate. So it doesn't actually necessarily have to lead to this enormous you know, turnover and a bunch of people basically go belly up on their mortgages. Do you see just the structure of mortgages in the US today compared to 2007, 2008 being a big factor in terms of housing? So he's right about that if you're trading CDS and things like that. But mm-hmm. in terms of the actual housing market value, I was one of my best trades ever. And calling that out, when even Chairman Greenspan said, oh, we've never declined in the U.S. housing market over a full one-year base. I'm like, it's simple. You pump too much and you dump too much. It's just <laughs> happened again. We front-loaded six to seven years of real estate, tra- real estate transactions into two. It's not that simple. And we did it with pumping and interest rates at the lowest ever. Mm. I mean, my son bought a place in Maryland, and he was able to get 2.5% zero down. He's locked in for 30 years. I'm like, dude, we got to buy more of this. I mean, and we're not the only ones. Now that trade's gone forever. Um, and the only way to really alleviate, the number one way to alleviate a lot of the related inflation is prices have to go down. It's not, it's not that complicated. Anytime you do like, if you want to do like a 120 month moving average, I've looked at all the supply and demand trends and prices have to go down. That's where they go down the least. But Miami, sure, they'll collapse. But the way I like to point it out is, Mike, is from everything I was exposed to, farmland in the Midwest, Miami condos, homes in Maryland, every place I was exposed to, everything went up about 40%. What did money supply do? Got it. And what money, mm. What's money supply doing now? Mm. So we just front loaded so much, it's going to go back down. And I'm talking about homes and prices. I'm not talking about the financial problem, which Mr. Paulson was pointing out. I read the article. He was right. We're not having, you know, banks are pretty well leveraged. It's the value of the asset has to go down. And if it doesn't, we'll have more inflation if that'll keep tightening until it goes down. That's been Mm. clear. And the number one leading indicator is the stock market right now. Mm. Mm. Maybe we could, uh, you know, wind things down with, I'd love to just get your your perspective on maybe US relative strength versus other countries, right? So, I mean, there's a lot of talk, something that you hear very often phrased in different ways, ways, right? But Europe is in a pretty tough situation. I think we've already talked about that enough, but this kind of rising power competition competition in between the United States and China, right? Very famous kind of the Thucydides trap, people like to say, which is one empire that's on the decline, the other is on the up, and it causes this this competition in powers. I would just love to get your thoughts on where you fall down in between uh, or how you kind of view the competition in between the US and China. The US is crushing it, will crush it, and China will not be able to catch up unless they change their, their regime to something less autocratic and more market sensitive. It's they're getting crushed. Mm-hmm. And I'd love to debate Mark Yusko on that. And this is a point I made about even before the invasion, that as soon as it came obvious they were gonna invade, Cruel told us this, mm-hmm. this is gonna be the US century. It tilts all the scales because China's pushed back on, on cryptos partly because their system does not allow it. They, everybody in China wants to get access to the dollar from here. That's what I hear from people I know there and the mm-hmm. Bloomberg Connections. And they, um, why do they steal intellectual property? property? Because they have to. The housing market's collapsing. The China you know, communist system put a, a billion people in poverty. Oh, great. They took them out of poverty. Now they're pushing them back into poverty just by studying the history of China. One leader, now it's not China anymore. It's Z. President Z, one person, autocratic leader, eliminate corruption means anybody disagrees with you is, is out, so you don't have the free market capsule. So I view this as they just put the world on a platter for the U.S. to excel by simply not messing it up. Europe messed it up. I mean, energy. We pointed out that, about that before. When you don't have energy independence, you're that dependent on regimes like Russia. It's bad. What has the U.S. done? Not only have we created this massive amount of liquid fuel excessive consumption. Yes, it's a lot of limits like the Keystone Pipeline, but if you include Canada, 20% excess next year, maybe a little less. Um, And we've reduced consumption. The whole world's going to follow that model because we were the head of it. It's that reduced consumption because efficiency. Now we're in this biggest retooling ever because of EV. So I look at it as this is unstoppable. The dollar says that the Chinas cannot pick up, even catch up. Why do they want a, a CBDC? Because no one wants to touch that currency. I mean, I've traveled overseas in Europe, 
you want? Oh, you got dollars? <laughs> you know, it, yeah. it's um, it's just to me, this is beginning of I think China peaked in about a couple of years ago. Um, and literally, I've seen it before. We all remember. See, I grew up with the Soviet Union, how they're going to crush us. That failed. I remember, and this even from a uh, capitalist standpoint, how I worked for Japanese companies all my life. That peaked in 1990. It was just a big fallacy. Now look at where Japan is now. And the U.S., just by the – we have the advantage of the proper system in the right um, – like DNA. I mean, everybody in this country are coming here because they, they typically want to succeed. So I'll end with this. The one thing I really enjoyed about reading the book, 21 Lessons of 21st Century, three years ago by mm. Yuval Noah Harari, is it's a very simple fact. You don't want to be bullish any country where no one wants to immigrate to and that's not tolerant. The number two countries, number one and two countries where no one wants to immigrate, the mass ones in the country, but it's not in the world that don't, are not tolerant, it's China and Russia. And why do we have problems with immigration in this country? It's because people want to come here. Like, I'm, you know, the son of European peasants. So I look at this as the U.S. century kicking in. Energy is a good example. Agriculture is a good example. And those are the basics. Now, when we start, you know, protecting our intellectual property a little more, um, it's among, among other things, um, I just view this as good luck, China. You're not going to – It's you have to get to a system where you have people telling you you're doing things wrong so you can check mark that. And we do a lot of that in this country. Yeah. I would tend to agree with that. Um, Mike, you've been super generous with your time here. Thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. I always learn a lot when we talk. If folks want to figure out more about you, follow the good work that you do at Bloomberg Intelligence, what's the best way to do it? Um, on LinkedIn, just Mike McGlone um, at Bloomberg. Twitter, Mike McGlone 11. And that's about it. I, if you, There's been some scams out there. I don't do Instagram and all that, some of the other stuff because I'm too many scams. But those at LinkedIn and uh, Twitter, I'm happy to, to p put people on my distribution list. Just reach out and get your email and I'll add you. I also, I, I got to give a plug to your, your uh, the content that you put out. It's, first of all, it's always extremely topical. It's usually stuff that I find myself thinking about as well. And you, it's very digestible, right? It's like usually like three bullets, really nice chart. I just read it quickly, feel like I'm smarter for it, and then go on <laughs> with my day and probably, uh, you know, don't digest as much as I should. But really, really love the way that you put the content out. Well, that's the focus. Um, and my goal, like every day, is to what is matters the most that I can write about in my space, commodities, cryptos, and what matters, and to focus on the tweaking, the points that I think people really, really need to know that might not, might not widely be known. Like sometimes I remember getting a little bit of criticism here, like, oh, I'm too technical. I'm like, well, most people know everything that's going on in Wall Street Journal. You can see on TV and CNN and CNBC, and I try to focus on the stuff you might not know, and that's stuff I publish on. Yeah. It's very hard. So I... It's very hard sometimes to figure out what advice you should listen to about being it when you're yeah. a content creator. It, because people will well, tell you very diametrically opposed things. I kind of have a framework for what I listen to and what I don't now, but it was very confusing for yeah. me in the beginning. Yeah. yeah, that's well, that's part of that idiot versus genius factor. And I got that a lot um, when I was wrong about energy. I'm still wrong about some. I'm always going to be wrong a lot of things. But I had to present at Miami Dade College last week. And I love presenting to the young people because a lot of times they'll just repeat the narrative they've heard from the popular press. And they were shocked when I was bearish crude oil. I'm like, I've been bearish crude oil for a little too long. And here's why. And they one of I remember my point out, do you realize crude oil right now is the same price it was actually is 10% down from 10 years ago? And they didn't realize that. I'm like, why is that? It's because of this paradigm shift in the U.S., what's happened with our energy. And when people tell me to ignore the rules of Adam Smith and Milton Friedman, Friedman and focus on this little tree that, oh, maybe we're not going to focus as much as in, in producing energy. And I usually look back and say, well, that's my opportunity. Mm. Yeah, the press is quite good for – I have a – I would push back against this narrative, kind of the Balaji Srinivasan idea where you know media is going away and it's all going to be these individual contributors just talking on their Twitter accounts. I, I don't really believe in that. I think the press uh, and the media serves a, an increasingly important, frankly, purpose. Um, but I will say you should probably not listen to the press when it comes to financial advice because what the, what the media is trying to do is say, what do I think people are thinking about? What has entered the public conscious? Whenever they're writing about something, that means they think there's a big market for it, which means everyone already knows about it, which means it's probably about to reverse. You know? So you should probably do the opposite. What you do to me is one of the most intellectual, educational, stimulative things 
I've ever seen. I've been just to be able to listen to a podcast and choose who I want to listen to right away and not get the extremes of the media. Men or the media gets hits on, I mean, when you write in a newspaper in the old days, you wouldn't write about good things. You'd write about crime, right? <laughs> That's what gets the hit. Right. So mm-hmm. you're, but it's the same thing, but you bring out the truth. And I like to point out that it's also unconsidered the source. Media needs to get readership. And then oftentimes, like if you hear a sell site analyst, what's their bias? They need to kind mm-hmm. of support other things. You know who brings that out a lot is uh, David Rosenberg. I, thought, I really enjoy his stuff. When he used to work at, he was Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and now he's independent. Yeah. You just get the facts. This is what yeah. I think and why. I agree. Yeah. You can always, I mean, everyone to some degree, one thing that I have learned as well is everyone to a certain degree talks their own books. And bias is actually, I mean, yeah. we could do a whole episode on just the different yeah. types of bias that exists, but um, I don't think basically anyone is without bias. And I think if you, it, it's on, it, one of the difficult things is it's sort of on you, the reader to like parse out why someone might be yeah. saying the things that they're saying. Doesn't mean you should ignore it, but you should just be aware of what are the underlying reasons why someone might be saying something. It's always a good thing to point uh, out. Exactly. Good point. Um, I have a bias, admit that right away. And, but that's the key thing I love about what I do in markets now is I'm not buy side, sell side. My main goal is getting it right. Mm. And um, readership, hopefully it will come in the long term. Because the thing I'd like to say is I can write the best research on the planet, but I don't, if I don't have a good headline to get people's attention, yes, sometimes I have to play that game of clickbait, but it's just part of life. The bottom line is here's my analysis, no bias. No one's telling me I have to lean either way. I don't have positions, but that's the key thing I learned on Wall Street is when you do have positions, the quote I remember learning is, well, do you expect other people to talk to your book? <laughs> talk your own book. I mean, I want to know the reason why you're long or, bo- or short. If it's yeah. real money and you're doing yeah, I want to know your reasons. And if I think, so it's a contrarian factor too. I'm like, some people would like this morning in the chat, the guy put unsubscribe when I put up my comment. I'm like, okay, well then just do the opposite. Maybe you make some money. Good luck with that one. All right, Mike, I appreciate it. You've been super generous with your time. Always enjoy our chats from one mic to another. We'll have to do it again soon. Thank you, Michael. Cheers.